coming today to um, the 18th annual St. David's Day Open Poetry Reading, which is pretty cool. Thank you for all the Spirit Lakers that have come before and everyone that worked to put this together. So I brought a poem that I like to read at poetry readings because I think it's nice for us poets to laugh at. What a strange pursuit writing poetry is sometimes. I'm gonna talk about myself in verse and you just have to like sit there and say that it's learned. Um, it's, it's a poem by James Tate um, called Teaching the Ape to Write Poems. They didn't have much trouble teaching the ape to write poems. First, they strapped him into the chair, then tied the pencil around his hand. The paper had already been nailed down. Then Dr. Blue Spire leaned over his shoulder and whispered into his ear, you look like a god sitting there. Why don't you try writing something? Okay, uh, this one's called Community. How much of the neighborhood I can see this afternoon, avoiding eye contact, looking busy. How much of this neighborhood I can hear this afternoon, birds nesting in my gutters, more homes than I wanted in my house. How much of this neighborhood I can see this afternoon, fences torn down, and then the houses, now patches of sand, marked by front walks, numbered, and a child's handprint, summer 92. If you've noticed, the weather's been getting warmer. We're up to about 20 degrees. And there are, you probably are glad that it's not below zero, but there are people who really like that weather. And this poem is for them. <laughs> Old men in embarrassed Minnesota. Old men in embarrassed Minnesota are waiting for the cold, waiting for the cold to drain all the blood from the thermometer. During the night of February 2nd, 1996, Roland Fowler's official embarrassed thermometer froze while nearby Tower, Minnesota recorded the United States record with the exception of Alaska, cold temperature of 60 degrees below zero. Even though an unofficial 64 degrees below zero was recorded at the Timber Hall in downtown Embarrass. Fowler's new thermometer will now record down to 80 degrees below zero. <laughs> Scraping the frost off the window at the first light of each day, the old men in Embarrass, Minnesota, are waiting, waiting yet for the cold. <laughs> Thank you. How to enter a home that won't last. Keep your running shoes on and your coat and the scarf pressed like a bandage against your lips, preventing talk. Look for rugs to muffle your steps. Eat only when others sleep. Bathe in a trickle of water that slides down the drain like a bead of sweat between the breasts of a mother or someone taking flight. Remember how to disappear. Avoid mirrors, examine windows, don't undress for bed. How to leave. Slip through the smallest space like a draft. Pick side roads, leap fences, land on your toes. Don't look back. Doze off at noon and wake in the dark where cabin lights flicker like feral eyes. Flit from one threshold to another, nosing each of them like a stray. Lap up some milk and move on. How to deflect a home that won't last. Pluck the word from your hopes and slip it under someone else's welcome mat. Replace it with vagabond, or better yet, adventurer. Open your mouth and taste the wind that courses against your lips. They will be chapped. Don't let them heal. The day the tip of your tongue meets velvet, you've stayed too long.
So I too have a little ode to winter. Um, I like winter because it gives me an opportunity to do things uh, late at night when everybody else is sleeping. But then sometimes I get really cold and this is a poem about that. Uh, Midwinter's Nap. Night cold, settling into the plaster and joists. I climb the stairs, shoulders stiff from chill. Teeth brush and face washed, now numb limbs disrobe. Rumbled breaths promise a heated den. I break the slumber-sealed comforter smoothly to maintain the breath-cadenced repose. Easing under, I stretch my limbs to the length of the corporal warmth, cautious not to make contact. Thawing slowly, then carefully, skin to skin, tendons released, hair lifted by breath, I rest. Hey everybody, I have a cold, so I might sound like Leonard Cohen by the end of this thing. <clears throat> I was trying to decide what I'd read tonight, um, looking through my stuff, and uh, I don't normally characterize my work as being particularly confessional, but as I'm paging through, I find all this stuff that could easily fit into an anthology of uh, unintentional infatuation for imaginary girlfriends, and so... <clears throat> Uh, this one's uh, for all of you romantic poet -y types. It's called A Good Night uh, to Be a Poet or A Poem for Stardust. You look like a writer. You look like a poet. You look like someone who needs a poem. But how can stardust need a poem? Every atom in your body, each from a different star, that I should write for you? I am but a man who comes from lesser dust, that of meteor or moon. Not that a moon is so bad, it's just that a moon never had its own light or its own heat until now that you take the stage. And oh, how you glow. You flow diaphanous in sleeves, your hair the color of late season leaves. You speak a flock of doves released your words are diamonds, leather, white cotton socks. You share your heart in worn Birkenstocks. You read to me from sheaves, thumbed, dog-eared, soft. Now stardust listens to the sound of one poet's heaven, spiral bound. It is a good night to be a poet. cold too. <clears throat> That'll get me out of here. It's very nice to see uh, you all again and it, I was thinking that I hardly ever see any of you except at this time of the year and unless I'm missing something, is there a, <laughs> is, is there a salon where you all hang out that I, I don't know about? Well, why don't we start one? These are uh, two very short poems about the same subject written on the same day. Um, I think the only thing that you need to know is that uh, cardinals mate for life, mostly. Some of them don't, but most of them do. <laughs> this, <laughs> there's, there's things about cardinals, but generally speaking, they mate for life, okay? <laughs> Come on, you're killing, the, you're, kill, you're killing the mood. I, I probably shouldn't tell you that this is in memory of my parents. I mean, it's, just, it's called early birds. Up betimes with the dawn, 
before the Siskin wheeze and the chip of Finch, just ahead of the Malthusian excited scratch and crunch, the red and brownish red crested life mates chase a bit in the lilac skeleton, then find an eastern twig and face the 650 sun. It catches full their twinned prideful breasts, fluffed against the 10 degrees, certain the deck is theirs for the morning, if not the season, a perched match, just a restless month from twigs and hormones before ambitious blue or brown brigands ahead of eggs, seeds, songs. No thought now of down or peep, no time or rush today, just the habit of color and proximity. <clears throat> this, uh, this, this second poem is called Burly Words, with profuse apologies to John Ashbery. Busy making an omelet and stirring the juice, you don't expect to see this sort of thing. Too early for such habitual pleasantry, I mumbled toward the sliding glass door, but no one heard or cared. It's Saturday. They're all sleeping late. Solitude has its advantages. That word comes from soul, doesn't it? But today, just this once, couldn't an exception be made? Couldn't it come from Saul? Basking ahead of the multitudes, must require you to step or fly lively because when the heat is on at Grand Central Station, you can kiss this millet, that perch, and all your sparky tooziness goodbye. Out here, it's greed and seed. Puff up as red as you want. We don't give a damn. It's not about the territory now. It's March 1st. The only eggs amounting to anything out here today are all inside. Thank you. I have a cold, too. <laughs> Dimensions. I like to think about parallel universes, how many there might be less than an atom's width away from my breasts, which project into time as I walk. They always arrive first before the rest of me, then my nose, then my chin, and last, my bounding, well-rounded rear end. I wonder what the future thinks as I turn the corner, for I can't see it, but it must surely see me. The last I read, there may be at least 10 dimensions. So I could imagine 10 different lives, but prefer to put myself in the same one at the exact same moment in time. On a dock, on a lake, on a misty June night, White pines and their resinous perfume enfold two silhouettes locked in trembling embrace. My futures pressed against his chest, his hands on my fabulous past. <laughs> And this is a poem about Elvis Presley and a donkey named Elvis that I knew when I used to ride at Spring Hill Dairy uh, 40-some years ago. The Lesser of Two Elvis. One was king of rock and roll. One was king of the barnyard. Elvis the king sang a lot. Elvis the donkey sang a lot. Elvis swiveled his hips. Elvis swiveled his ears. Elvis got a lot of ass. Elvis was a lot of ass. <laughs> Elvis got fat and forgot his songs. Elvis sang the same song every day. Elvis had no time to smell the flowers. Elvis ate the flowers and smelled. Elvis died alone on the toilet. Elvis died in his sleep under the stars. Thank you. Kathleen and hi everybody. This poem's called uh, Folklore. 
Bearded pines congregate each winter above caves of ice. Their beards blankets twinkling, shimmering in moments when the sun glances through bulging billows. Like the ancient guideposts in the sky that rotate past the points of their gaze each night. Smooth snarls of hair descend together, rolling, twisting to pinnacles of ice, dripping with impermanence. Yet their roots oppose the erosion of the clay red shore. They stand together with sandstone, sandstone rock in defiance of what is inevitable. United against the waves of the Great Lake, too young to be even a footnote in the War of the Stars. Thanks. I've sat here before. <laughs> Pardon? You took that chair home once. I took this chair home once and I recovered it so that everyone can sign it. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Joe. Pabot Joe, thinking he was a purebred black lab. Soon it became clear there had been a scandal in the family. His hair grew long and curly his build stocky. He was a quiet dog, patient, intelligent, responsive, always ready to go exploring, waiting at the mailbox for the, for the school bus. Over the years, his fear of loud noise grew. Guns and thunderstorms caused him to quiver and come into the house, once ripping our screen door to shreds in his panic. In old age, he got distemper with no cure known. Pa took his gun and called twice because, because the gun was obvious and walked with him to the far edge of the field by the woods. The first shot missed as tears blurred Pa's vision. Joe sat still and waited for the second. Almost as tall as people when they sit, so I'm going to stand. <laughs> or maybe not. It's a, <laughs> something different. This one's called Old Testaments. Back then, we kept the Sabbath, paid tithe, sent our wedding rings and the $700 from selling the farm to a radio evangelist. The rest of the 7,000 was entrusted to a silver dealer in Arizona and never seen again. For decades, we received calendars and letters from the voice of prophecy, fishing for more money. After 30 years of betrayal, the, I'm sorry, after 30 years, the betrayal of unanswered prayers has faded. We fill in the blanks with our own beliefs. This one's called Biography of a Blossom. Each morning I cut up an apple to take to school, not from a backyard tree, but New Zealand hills, soft with pink, where our winter snow is summer dust. Lobed fruit travels to Wisconsin in dark holds of ships, unloads like coal. Trucks to the local grocer, lines up like valentines from the sun. Hello. So actually, I imagine myself standing while I said this, but I Well, this doesn't really have a title, but we can call it a prayer. I think that my value system is relative to the position that I find myself in. 
I can see why religions had to write it all down on paper just to make sure we were on the same page. My people, we burn sage. I hear it's good for the soul, so good that they wrote it down on birch bark scrolls, but we don't really read those anymore, but that's not to say that we don't need them anymore. In fact, I pray to my grandmothers daily. Grandmothers, come and save me. Otherwise, I am subjected to the dirty lyrics of a rap song, and all they have to tell me is to shake it all night long. Grandmothers. Though a thousand years of hard-earned righteous learning had been punched and pillaged out of you, I'm still looking for you to tell me what to do. Grandmothers, I'm on a mission, or I'm not on a mission for purity, but for respect. I've reached my hand out for love, but all I've gotten is, gotten is neglect. Grandmothers, I know what I'm asking is simple, albeit not easy. For now, hold my hand, stand me up, and dust me off. Codes. A person chopping a carrot must be in close attendance to the knife and to the carrot during the chopping process. A person entering a password must be in close attendance to capitalization. A person paying a bill online must be in close attendance to the number being typed. A person brushing a once feral cat must be in close attendance to the cat, the brush, and the position of the cat's claws and teeth during the brushing process. <laughs> A person dusting a mantle doesn't really need to be in close attendance to the dust rag as long as standards for cleanliness are low. A person peeling a two-week-old clementine should be in close attendance to the shriveled segment that is best discarded, while not neglecting to also be in attendance to the fresh and tasty part. A person removing a Christmas tree from the house on the last day of February must be in close attendance to the relationship between the width of the tree and that of the door, and to the location in the house of the once feral cat. <laughs> a person eating a lot of gluten-free chocolate chip cookies should be in at least some attendance to the fact that said cookies are not a health food. A person preparing to go for a walk must be in close attendance to the weather, including its changes during the hour between intent to leave the house and actual exit. A person talking on the phone to a pregnant sister while stirring broth and chopping vegetables must be in close attendance to the sister and the soup. A person who is walking in the woods does best to be in partial attendance to the walking process and also to move with some degree of abandon. A person walking under a blue sky on the last day of February will enjoy being in close attendance to the sky. A person who is breathing is best to not be in close attendance to the breathing process. <laughs> so last night I shot pool at the Reef Bar. It was the first time I'd shot pool in a long time and discovered that uh, what limited skills I had uh, were completely lost. But it reminded me of the stupidest poem I ever wrote, uh, or at least is in contention for it. And so uh, I'll share that tonight, but uh, I have to explain something about it first. It's, uh, the title of the poem is Consulting the Magic Eight Ball. And uh, this is not an eight ball, uh, not a pool eight ball. It's, it's, some people are nodding their heads, but I found I'm just starting to get to the age where I talk about things and 20 year olds go, what are you? talking about. Uh, so the Magic 8-Ball is sort of a fortune-telling 8-Ball. Uh, it uh, looks like an 8-Ball from a pool table, but it's larger, it's plastic, there's liquid inside, and a 20-sided die that will answer your questions. So if you're wondering if Kenny is going to take you to the senior prom, you ask the 8-Ball and it will tell you yes, and you will know that that will come true and you'll be filled with joy. So consulting the Magic 8-Ball. Will I one day find true love? My sources say no. <laughs> Will I always eat cookie crumbs off of my shirt? It is decidedly so.
say the time of moon is not right for escape. It's the color of the lower sky, too broadly suffused, or the wind in my tie. No, amazedly how, often one takes his madness into his own hands and keeps it. This is a poem by a poet named Paul Violi. He's a New York poet, and he died a few years ago. I think this is a good poem to read after getting a speeding ticket. <laughs> See if you agree. <laughs> it's called Extenuating Circumstances. I don't know how fast I was going, but even so, that's still an intriguing question, officer. <laughs> and deserves a thoughtful response. <laughs> With the radio unfurling Beethoven's Ode to Joy, you might consider anything under 80 sacrilege, particularly on a parkway as lovely as the one you're fortunate enough to patrol, and patrol so diligently. A loveliness that, if observed at the appropriate rate of speed, affords the kind of pleasure which is in itself a reminder of how civilization depends on the assurance of order and measure, and a devotion of someone, like yourself, to help maintain it. Yes, man the measurer, the incorrigible measurer, and admirably precise measurements they are, not, of course, as an end in themselves, but, lest we forget, as a means to propel us into the immeasurable, where it would be anyone's guess how fast the west wind was blowing when it strummed a rainbow and gave birth to arrows. Never forget that a parkway is a work of art, and the faster one goes, the greater the tribute to its powers of inspiration. A lyrical propulsion that approaches the spiritual and tempts, demands the most intrepid of us to take it from there. That sense of the illimitable, illimitable <laughs> when we feel we are the most glory and the je than the jest or the riddle of the world. That's what kicked in, albeit briefly, as I approached the Croton Reservoir Bridge. And a night like this, starlight reignited above a snowfall's last flurry, cockeyed headlights scanning the girders overhead, eggshell snow crust flying off the hood, hatching me on the wing like a song breaking through prose, the kind I usually sing through my nose. Thank you. Hello again. I'm going to read a poem out of Cicadas by Roberta Hill. She teaches at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and I'm thrilled to say she will be reading at UWS sometime early April. I forget the exact date. I'm looking to see if anyone else remembers. <laughs> early April. <laughs> Keep your eye out. This is a wonderful collection that came out also from Holy Cow Press in 2013. I enjoyed the entire collection. The poem that I picked tonight, not necessarily my favorite in the collection, but when I read it, it struck me as it, it felt like a parent's blessing on the narrator of the poem I shared earlier. So I wanted to read it. Wherever in winter, wherever in winter you go, child, I hope our prayers flutter behind you in the wind the moon's waxing toward a quarter with Venus shining to its east. Together they'll travel this January night, crossing each other at the horizon in a cold moment before dawn. By that time, you may be crossing for home. I've asked each tree, each tower of steel and glass, each shrub along the alleys if they've seen you passing by. Without a word, you disappeared quickly into these quaking cities. I wake at 4 a.m. feeling wind blowing in every room. No one on earth has yet helped me understand this bare sadness rushing through dark halls. 
Did my father feel the same anxiety, staring at the blue of his bedroom on those nights when the smell of mud and rain filled me with an energy I never could de deny? I tell myself stories about the prodigal, the youthful immortals of Asia, the restless coyote sniffing a pile of snow and shit. Tomorrow you'll look from a window where people rush to work and perhaps in that moment find the red road and a friend. Someone will surely say that is her child. I recognize the face. And when they ask, you'll call. I keep faith that wherever you are, spirits of this earth and sky keep you aware of how we are related to everything here. Well, I feel like tonight everyone has been uh, very lighthearted and uh, focusing on nature and happiness, and I've just come to be the Debbie Downer, so. <laughs> um, uh, I have a little bit of a preface, and you're probably gonna think, oh no, she's gonna take up all her time talking. Don't worry, the poem is a sonnet, it's 16 lines, 18, whatever, it's however many lines a sonnet is. <laughs> So don't panic, I'm not gonna talk too much. It's okay, it'll be quick. Uh, this poem has meant a lot to me over the past years. I first heard of it in a beautiful play called Wit, where I, uh, which I starred in, I didn't star in. I had a, a role as uh, student three. And <laughs> it's a beautiful play about uh, life and death, and this uh, helped me reshape my thinking about death. It, it, it's a very, metaphysical poem, so please enjoy uh, Holy Sonnet number 10, Death Be Not Proud by John Donne. Death, be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, much pleasure then from thee must, much more must flow, and soonest our best men with thee do go. Rest of their bones and soul's delivery. Thou art a slave to fate, chance, kings and desperate men, and dust with poison, war and sickness dwell, and poppy, or charms can make us sleep as well and better than thy stroke. Why swell'st thou then? One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. A couple of uh, preliminary notes. Um, first of all, I want to thank Terry Caddo for uh, not accusing me of not teaching her that a sonnet has 14 <laughs> lines. Because you probably don't know this, but Terry was my student up at Masabi Range many years ago, and uh, she's doing a dandy job with the budgeteer now, in case you're familiar with that. Uh, uh, piece of writing in Duluth, and Terry, great job, keep up the good work. 14 lines, remember, 14. <laughs> <clears throat> now, uh, since that salon that I was talking about earlier does not exist, I was, not, uh, I was denied the privilege of getting to know one Cat Mandeville when she was here in Duluth. And I introduced myself to her a couple of times down at Amazing Grace. I thought that she needed to be represented here. Now, if any of you that know her work must have figured out by now that uh, picking a poem out of her collection would, is a prodigious assignment. And I certainly was not going to memorize any of them, even the short ones, which would have done her great honor because she, of course, memorized all of the works that she read. But this is a short little poem called Cupid. I watch her laugh, wonder about legs and knees, how far they will carry her, how far she will let them. 
Look, Daddy, to a man in khaki. No matter where I point the gun, the Nerf arrow goes where it wants to. Daddy laughs, unconcerned. From the park bench, I drop my head. No, little girl, learn to hit your targets now before they start moving. And stand with my briefcase, greasy from lunch break. A sponged finger pops me in the forehead. Pfft! I wilt to my knees, my face eating wood chips. A pink, feathery voice above me. Thought you could get away, did you? Thank you. Keep looking around for Kanye. If he's going to question my artistry, you know. <laughs> this is a poem by Margaret Atwood, um, and it's called "Variation on the Word Sleep." I would like to watch you sleeping, which may not happen. I would like to watch you sleeping. I would like to sleep with you to enter your sleep as its smooth, dark wave slides over my head and walk with you through that lucent, wavering forest of blue-green leaves with its watery sun and three moons towards the cave where you must ascend towards your worst fear. I would like to give you the silver branch, the small white flower, the one word that will protect you from the grief at the center of your dream. From the grief at the center, I would like to follow you up the long stairway again and become the boat that would row you back carefully, a flame in two cupped hands to where your body lies beside me. And as you enter it, as easily as breathing in, I would like to be the air that inhabits you for a moment only. I would like to be that unnoticed and that necessary. Um, I'm going to read a poem by Josh Mahigan, and it's, um, it's from a book he wrote called Accepting the Disaster. Um, the poem is called The Payphone. And it takes, either it was written in 1982 or it takes place in 1982. And I think that's much more appropriate than today. Um, a payphone is ringing. It is 1215, a balmy summer weeknight. No one around. The ringing is both urgent and routine. Loud, sharp, and even, it is the only sound. It reaches to the fountain and marigold bed and down the dress shop alley and back again. Up past the darkened windows overhead, past the green turret, past the finial. Then the phone stops ringing. The air continues to ring. When it too stops, the calm feels tentative. But soon it's strong, too strong. It's sickening. This is no place for human beings to live. Then, once again, the payphone starts to ring. It will go right on ringing. No one at all will hear this sound. No one is listening. But someone must have some interest in this call. The phone rings with enough force to be heard 200 miles and 30 years away. And who is the caller? A mad lover spurred by a broken promise? A client allowed to stray from bed at willing helpers? Could it be a desperate spouse out to arrange a hit? Or is it a wrong number? No, it's me at 13. Oh, how I wish I could answer it. Thanks.
This is a poem by Sharon Olds. It's called Mrs. Krikorian. She saved me. When I arrived in sixth grade, a known criminal, the new teacher asked me to stay after school the first day. She said, I've heard about you. <laughs> she was a tall woman with a deep crevice between her breasts and a large, calm nose. She said, this is a special library pass. As soon as you're finished with your hour's work, uh, an hour's work that took 10 minutes, and then the devil glanced into the room and found me empty, a house standing open, you can go to the library. Every hour I'd zip through the work in a dash and slip out of my seat as if out of God's side and sail down to the library, solo through the empty, powerful halls, flash my pass and stroll over to the dictionary to look up the most interesting word I knew, spank. Dipping two fingers into the jar of library paste to suck that tart mucilage as I came to the page with the cocker spaniel's silks curling up like fine steam of the body. After spank and breast, I'd move on to Abe Lincoln and Helen Keller, safe in their goodness till the bell. Thanks to Mrs. Krikorian, amiable giantess with kind eyes. When she asked me to write a play and direct it, and it was a flop, and I hid in the coat closet, she brought me a candy cane as you lay a peppermint on the tongue and the worm will come up out of the bowel to get it. And so I was emptied of Lucifer and filled with school glue and Eros and Amelia Earhart saved by Mrs. Krikorian. <laughs> and who saved Mrs. Krikorian? When the Turks came across Armenia, who slid her into the belly of a quilt? Who locked her in a chest and mailed her to America, and that one who saved her, and that one who saved her to save the one who saved Mrs. Krikorian, who was standing there on the sill of sixth grade, a wide-hipped angel, smoky-haired, standing up weightless all around her head. I end up owing my soul to so many, to the Armenian nation, one more soul, someone jammed behind a stove, drove deep into a crack in a wall, shoved under a bed. I would wake up in the morning under my bed, not knowing how I had got there, and lie in the dusk, the dust balls beside my face, round and ashen, shining slightly with the eerie comfort of what is neither good nor evil. I'm going to read a poem by Francis Ponch, who um, wrote about all kinds of different objects like or, or creatures, like, let's see, the frog, dung, the granary. He wrote about shells and potatoes. And uh, I'm going to read a poem about stoves. It's called Stoves. <laughs> the animation of stoves is in inverse ratio to the clemency of the weather. But how testify our gratitude properly to these modest towers of heat? We who adore them as much as tree trunks, radiators of shade and damp coolness in the summer, cannot nevertheless embrace them, nor even approach them too closely without getting red. With all those little cracklings as they dilate, they warn us off. How good it is then to prop open their door and to discover their ardor, then with a sadistic firebrand to agitate the depths of the color range, changing the glowing coal embers from black to red and from fire to a tender gray and the embers into cinders. If they grow cold, a resounding sneeze soon warns you of a head cold coming to punish your wrongdoings. 
the relations between a man and his stove are very far from being those of a milord and his valet. This is a poem by Carol Ann Duffy, and I just loved it. And because it's February, it's called Valentine. Not a red rose or a satin heart. I give you an onion. It is a moon wrapped in brown paper. It promises light like the careful undressing of love. Here, it will blind you with tears like a lover. It will make your reflection a wobbling photo of grief. I am trying to be truthful, not a cute card or a kissogram. I give you an onion. Its fierce kiss will stay on your lips, possessive and faithful as we are for as long as we are. Take it. Its platinum loops shrink to a wedding ring if you like, and lethal. Its scent will cling to your fingers, cling to your knife. Hello. Um, tonight's my first poetry night ever, so thank you guys. I wasn't actually planning on reading anything or, in this case, singing anything, but um, I'm not technically a, a poet, I guess, but I'm, I'm a musician, so I guess we're in the same family. Um, and I wanted to sing something for a while um, in some fashion somewhere, but it's never come up, and I thought this could be a good time to do it. Um, it's a, a poet songwriter named Scott Allen, uh, and I think it's appropriate for tonight. I don't, I don't know if this is going to be rough or not, but it's called Now. And it's a, I don't have a phone here, but it's a, it's a phone call. Hey. I got your message that you stopped by the apartment. No worries, leave your things here for one more day. I don't know why this happened. My life is dark as hell without you. The room feels so much colder since you went away. Brian, I don't want this. Why can't we sit and talk this through? I'm losing sleep and I need you to come back home to me now. Since your brother's birthday is Friday, I sent a card from both of us. The day before there was no us. How was I to know? Don't worry about your clothes and all. Maybe I will pack them up. Make this easier on both of us. Well, just for you. Because everything is breaking down now since you've been gone. I don't even know the days. I don't know where to start. I'm in agony. There are times I can't breathe. Now. So, I guess that's it. Sorry for this message. Your bags will all be waiting. When you arrive, I hope you're doing well now. The next Spirit Lake Poetry Series reading will be Connie Wanick, who's a wonderful Duluth poet, here at Probe Gallery on March 28th, right? At 7.30. The chair. Uh, first of all, we did have a runner-up tonight. I think she's gone, actually. <laughs> but Danny, whose poem was very beautiful, was our second place tonight. Um, and our winner tonight, who will have to um, reduce the proximity of the poetry chair from the once feral cat, is <laughs> Julie Gard. 
<laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, I am extremely honored, and I will protect the chair from the cat, I promise.